welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Gov Connect webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking about CBD prevention and digital transformation. How can we challenge the status quo? My name's um, Helen Williams. I'm a consultant pharmacist and clinical advisor to UCL Partners and also national specialty advisor for cardiovascular disease prevention. I'm joined today by two great speakers who you're going to hear from shortly. Dr. Shuvik Haldar, who's a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist at the Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospital, and Dr. Yasser Javed, who's a GP, a GP with special interest in cardiovascular disease. And uh, both of them have huge amounts to share on this topic. I'm just trying to work out how to move my slides as I can't see a slide mover. There we go. So I'm going to do a little brief introduction, really, um, into the importance of um, innovation in CVD and focus particularly on atrial fibrillation, which is the A and the ABC of cardiovascular disease prevention. And we have national ambitions in terms of the detection and management of AF, moving from 79% detection when the long-term plan was launched to 85% detection by 2029, and 84% management of atrial fibrillation up to 90% um, by, again, 2029. Next slide, please. We've been doing really well. Well, we certainly were doing very well up until COVID. At the last COF analysis, we had found almost 83% of our AF patients. Obviously, that's based on modelling, so there is a risk that, that we might underestimate the number of AF patients we have to find. Still have a detection gap of 250,000 plus patients and a need to find about 33,000 to get to the national ambition of 2029. Next slide, please. Detection isn't the only uh, thing we need to worry about. Finding patients doesn't help them in terms of their outcome unless we ensure they are appropriately protected from stroke. And of patients who are at risk of stroke with AF, 87% of patients were anticoagulated in, at the end of the last COF year in March 2020. Uh, obviously, this was again pre-COVID with a treatment gap of 134,000 and around 24,000 patients needed to be treated to achieve the national ambition. So things look very good, but we do have to take into account the implications of COVID. Next slide, please. We've seen a reduction in face-to-face -face GP visits. We've seen a reduction in referrals to cardiovascular outpatient appointments. We've seen fewer new diagnoses gone into GPIT systems and a drop in the number of new cardiovascular disease prescriptions issued uh, as a result of COVID. Only one study has looked specifically at AF detection, uh, and that has shown um, nearly a 50% drop in the new diagnoses of AF in, in Denmark in the early days of the uh, pandemic and uh, most the most recent analysis of, of UK data suggests nearly half a billion fewer um, sorry half a billion fewer new uh, prescriptions for preventative cardiovascular disease medication so we feel that it's likely that COVID will have an impact on detection of AF uh, and also the um, treatment of, uh, of AF in terms of stroke prevention with anticoagulation next slide please so one of my roles um, within the academic health science networks was as clinical lead for the uh, national AF program and we had a program that looked at finding more AF so detection treating more patients to prevent stroke protection and also improving the patient pathway which we referred to as, as perfecting the pathway so our detect protect perfect approach looked at new and innovative ways of improving the detection and management of, of atrial fibrillation particularly and one of those was through improving the uptake of pulse checks but also the use of some of the new more novel devices for AF detection that you'll hear more about uh, from our keynote speakers. Next slide please. So in terms of best practice we knew that uh, we could utilize and harness innovative tools such as the CardioMobile app, which works with the smartphone, a device called My Diagnostic, which um, uh, the patient grasps and it records a single lead ECG, and special blood pressure machines that embed uh, an AF detection algorithm. So as the blood pressure is being measured, it will also detect irregularities in heart rhythm 
and flag, flag that to the user. So in terms of detecting AF, we know that opportunistic case finding is better than a systematic um, approach and certainly systematic screening is not recommended uh, currently by the UK Screening Committee, but targeted case finding, undertaking pulse checks and single VDCGs in patients who are at risk. Again, because of COVID, more opportunities for this more remote form of detection than is needed than we um, than we have used in the past. Next slide, please. And so one of the um, projects that we ran through the HSNs was around the imp implementation of mobile devices, testing where they may have their uh, greatest impact in terms of, of uh, detecting new AF. And we put devices, 6,000 devices across many different settings and high um, pickup rates were found in flu vaccination clinics because obviously that targets in general the over 65s particularly mental health services, where physical health checks are often um, not neglected, but are of less importance, maybe perceived to have been of less importance in the past, uh, and patients also less likely to want or accept 12 lead ECGs. Podiatry, patients sitting in their podiatry seat for 30 minutes, it's an ideal opportunity because of the comorbidities that are often seen to detect new AF. And finally, a, a more innovative setting, the fire service doing safe and well checks, particularly up in the northwest, uh, we're using a My Diagnostic, which gives a little uh, tick if the heart rhythm is regular and a cross if the heart rhythm is irregular. And they were going in and doing AF checks alongside checking people's smoke alarms for housebound patients. So opportunities to look for new AF in, patient, in places that we maybe wouldn't normally have uh, have looked. Next slide, please. So the AF, page, the, the AF program has made an impact. Over the four years that we were running the program, we've seen uh, 256,000 more people added to the AF register, nearly 300,000 more people anticoagulated for AF. We know that that translates into a reduction in stroke and, uh, and a reduction in stroke related mortality and savings to the the NHS. So opportunities for embedding innovative ways of working to improve the detection and management of a high risk condition to improve outcomes for patients and make savings for the NHS. It seems to be a win-win situation all round. So that, that's my introduction to the uh, program, to the, sorry, to the session today, the webinar. The real focus is what uh, Shuvik and uh, Yasser have to say. Hopefully their slides are going to pop up in a second, and I'm going to hand over to them to tell us more about how we can challenge the status quo. Um, I'll you. hand over to both of you because I know you're going to do a double act. Thank you very much, Helen. It's a pleasure to be here and actually genuinely honoured to be presenting alongside a wonderfully innovative secondary care colleague. Of course, cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, you've made the point, remains such a leading focus for us in healthcare as it remains a leading cause of mortality. And to be perfectly frank, that was true pre-COVID, during the pandemic, and will continue to be as we hopefully now transition into the post-COVID era. It's also a major cause, we mustn't forget, of premature mortality, morbidity and disability. And it's just a sad fact that many of our patients lose many good quality of life years to cardiovascular disease. I think you're right, the biggest challenge we're faced with at the moment is the diagnostic challenge. We've missed those crucial opportunities to proactively identify cardiovascular disease and its risk factors. Uh, but that's one of the very few silver linings of the pandemic though, you know, this increased appetite for the adoption of innovation, not just in terms of technology, but also innovative ways of working. I think the digital transformation in particular, and hopefully we're gonna make the case, Shovik and I, uh, th during this presentation, you know, far from being a compromise, is actually very much threatening to revolutionize the way we deploy cardiovascular prevention for the foreseeable future. And Shovik and I both think the time is ripe uh, to challenge the status quo and hopefully move seamlessly and wholeheartedly uh, into this uh, digital uh, era. So uh, these are our disclosures. Uh, we'll just pop these up uh, for a few moments. Um, AF, as Helen has reinforced, uh, you know, is a huge priority, remains a huge priority, has been for many years, simply because it's pretty clear it's the single leading independent risk factor for stroke. Have a look at the risk of stroke with and without AF. 
compare that to hypertension. And clearly, when AS patients start developing other risk factors, the risk actually just simply multiplies. And we must also uh, reinforce the fact that AF strokes are more devastating than other strokes. Have a look at this. I'll illustrate that with this CT scan. Uh, massive middle cerebral artery infarct. Chauvic, in, in atrial fibrillation, these patients develop these very large clots, you know, much larger clots than you're going to see in your sort of atherosclerotic carotid source of embolus. And they can block these proximal arteries. That That's correct, isn't it? It's all about the clot size. Absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, you know, we uh, undertake routine imaging of people's hearts when we, for example, do an ablation procedure. And, you know, we find really, really big clots tucked away in areas of the left atrium, which is one of the upper chambers of the heart. And you know what? What's surprising is sometimes you find these big clots despite anticoagulation. So you can imagine that, you know, those who don't have anticoagulation on board are very much at risk. So, yes, absolutely. Yes, sir. And tell us, Chauvin, these clots, uh, they can develop very quickly. I mean, there's this protocol I always remember in A&E. Don't cardiovert unless someone's been on an anticoagulant for six weeks, if they've been in AF for more than 48 hours. But I think some cardiologists are now very reluctant if it's more than 24 hours of AF. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's true. I think that the exact timing is still yet to be determined. But I think definitely if there is uncertainty in terms of duration, then you don't want to cardiovert because if there is a clot that's formed quite quickly and is hiding somewhere in the heart, if you cardiovert, then you're putting the heart back into sort of normal contractile mechanism and that clot can fly off from the heart into the brain. And then obviously the consequence is potentially devastating. Well, let's look at the consequences. So this is a middle cerebral artery infarct. That's You can see the size of the infarct. We've uh, sort of uh, encapsulated it in this sort of red uh, area. Uh, look at the midline shift of the brain. You don't have to be a stroke consultant to understand. If this patient even survives this stroke, which is debatable, this patient's going to have a horrific downstream trajectory. I mean, this patient's going to be aphasic, completely hemiplegic, and probably require a peg tube, spending their last few months lying in a nursing home bed, not being able to speak, swallow, or move. So these are devastating strokes. And the data definitely backs this up. Look at the uh, increased mortality, morbidity, and disability uh, associated with uh, AF strokes compared to non-AF strokes. And again, Shavik, this is very... Um, worrying epidemiological data from the European Society of Cardiology. I mean, they're suggesting now that once you've hit the age of 55, we've got a one in three lifetime uh, risk of atrial fibrillation. And of course, this is going to increase quite sharply just through natural aging of the population. I mean, I'm now practicing in a much older, frailer population than when I first uh, started, and multi morbidity is now the norm. So, Shovik. From a primary care perspective, should we almost be thinking of this as bread and butter general practice to just screen these patients uh, with these multiple risk factors and, and age being the biggest risk factor? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a few years ago, this graph was um, a one in five, one in four type of uh, trajectory. Now, the latest guidelines, as you're showing, 2020, one in three. I think there was a very interesting line that was talked about and picked up upon in the ESC last year, and that was AF never comes alone. And I really, really uh, believe in this. You know, I think the majority of the work with AF has to happen before AF sets in, and that's really lifestyle yeah. interventions. Absolutely. Um, so look, for me, I think of atrial fibrillation diagnosis, it's almost a race. You've got all of these high risk patients in front of you. What I wanna do is diagnose and anticoagulate this patient before the stroke wins the race. But sadly, stroke is winning the race far too often. And dare I say it, in the past year, that diagnostic gap has only widened. In fact, I'm going to challenge Shovik now. I don't think there's anything I do in general practice that has the impact of identifying an anticoagulating high-risk AF patient. If you look at the relative risk reduction of 70% of preventing such a horrific cardiovascular event, I mean... Is there anything you guys do in secondary care for an AF patient that comes anywhere near the impact, prognostic impact of anticoagulation? No, quite frankly. Um, you know, I think anticoagulation—sorry, anticoagulation is the key. That's the crux of everything, I think. You know, the, the things that we do in secondary care very much mitigate symptoms primarily. 
whether that's using drugs, you know, cardioverting patients or doing ablation. But the single most important thing is anticoagulation. Completely agree. Fantastic. And Helen's already, already reinforced the NHS long-term plan. I loved it because for the first time, we've got a long-term strategy with such a huge focus on cardiovascular disease. And you can see clearly AF is right at the forefront of that strategy, not just in terms of detection. And early detection is key, not just because these clots can develop quickly, uh, but also, Shovik, if you are going to do an intervention on an AF patient, Reinforce to us how important it is to get that diagnosis done early before the heart sort of got really used to the taste of AF. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So I think work is happening in the last few years really to say, you know, if we are going to intervene, um, particularly with a, a procedure, an invasive procedure, we're seeing that actually intervening early on in the time course of that disease uh, gives better results for the patient and in fact can potentially halt progression from, for example, that intermittent phase of AF going to a more sustained or persistent phase. So at present, still the guidelines would recommend that we go along with um, after anticoagulation, of course, kind of drugs, antiarrhythmic drugs, for example. But uh, actually, I think early identification and early, I guess, triaging of who would benefit from intervention is key. And I think that's where things are heading in the next five years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I noticed in the ESC and some of the seminal trials now are really moving in that direction of if you are going to intervene, do it early to get the best possible sort of outcome. Mm. Um, and it's very pleasing for me that NICE are finally looking at some of this innovative technology. I mean, for me, the Cardio Mobile, a live core device, I mean, it revolutionized my clinical practice. I wouldn't dream of doing a chronic disease review in a 70-year-old diabetic patient with hypertension without a quick check of their rhythm uh, to make sure they haven't gone into AF. So uh, NICE are now appraising uh, this technology for the ambulatory detection of atrial fibrillation, and we're very eagerly awaiting their sort of guidance on this, uh, which is anticipated to be uh, completed uh, early next year. But actually, the European Society of Cardiology, arguably the most prestigious guidance we have in cardiology, has already made a really, really important position statement in a class one recommendation. I mean, that's the highest level of evidence-based recommendation any guidance can give. Now recommending, and this is from published around last summer, recommending not just a 12 lead ECG, but actually a single lead ECG tracing of more than 30 seconds is now sufficient uh, to confirm that diagnosis. Shovik, what are your thoughts on that? And, and uh, 12 lead is obviously the gold standard, but what are your thoughts on single lead traces of 30 seconds? I think this was a really bold move by the ESC. Um, and, you know, I've been uh, had discussions with those who have been on the committee who wrote this document. I think we're really pleased that this has happened. The one caveat, I guess, to say is that it's fine to have the single lead ECG, but it's important to understand that the person who's looking at it does need to have some experience and expertise in looking at these sort of traces. That's my only caveat to, to this. And it's great to hear, Yasser, that you're using your, you know, your, your, your portable device for, you know, for example, home visits. But I guess that sort of practice um, will we'll be sort of um, not standard, I guess, for primary care. And it would be great to sort of get more education out to uh, primary care colleagues, because I think a little bit of education would really empower them and give them confidence to use this device. And, and now I, I very much endorse that. And also, Shovik, it's so important that we ensure good quality traces. Because And actually, that applies to a 12-lead ECG. Absolutely. At the end of the day, if you haven't got a good quality trace, as well as someone who's experts at interpreting ECG and to be honest it, any of us can be an expert with a bit of upskilling um, it, it is very much dependent on that whether it's a one lead 12 lead six lead uh, we, we need a diagnostic uh, quality trace now we have to be fair and balanced and we have to just accept that the recently published NICE guidance haven't quite gone that far as or as bold uh, I like your terminology but, you know the SE were bold NICE don't tend to be as bold initially. They probably they eventually will uh, cut and paste the SE guidance like they usually do in about three years. 
but they've uh, mentioned that manual pulse palpation should be your initial screen. And for my money, this is the quickest, cheapest, most effective way of screening for AF, unless your patient's in complete heart block, and in which case they're going to be unwell. Uh, you are always going to get an irregular pulse in persistent AF. But to confirm the diagnosis, they are now sort of mandating 12 lead ECG. But interestingly, they do mention for paroxysmal AF to uh, incorporate sort of ECG technology. And that's a pretty broad term that could encompass some of the technology that I think, Shovik, you're going you're gonna to talk about a bit later on. But I actually think the technology's moved on quite considerably from even the one lead portable devices. I mean, I've very much enjoyed using the six lead alive call cardio mobile, you know, going to Asian weddings pre pandemic screening everyone apart from my mother in law for atrial fibrillation was a was a great joy of mine in these uh, sort of six hour uh, uh, sort of I'm sure Shovit can relate to this. These very long protracted ceremonies uh, very useful device, uh, which has a third electrode, which you can patient sitting in front of you just rest anywhere on the left leg and look at the quality of the trace. I mean, this is one I did of myself, sadly, at 1.36 in the morning, which is more a reflection of my uh, life at the moment. But I think this is really good quality trace using Bluetooth technology. So moving away from that sound technology, which did give a bit of noise uh, in some uh, instances. Um, uh, but And crucially, you get a lead two, which for my money has always been the, the best lead for capturing those P waves, which is the key to unlocking uh, the rhythm on a patient. In fact, the proof is in the pudding. Let's put Kachovic on the spot here. I've got a patient, Kachovic. I've got this trace on them. I'm fairly confident with my sort of primary care hat on. This looks like atrial fibrillation. I can save this in the notes as a PDF. You're a very highly esteemed secondary care colleague. You're an EP uh, cardiologist of great repute. Are you happy for us in primary care to diagnose and anticoagulate? The key thing is, can I anticoagulate a patient on the basis of this uh, ECG trace? Is it of sufficient quality for you? Uh, this would be absolutely fine by me. I mean, uh, you know, we get a lot of strips sent to us by patients. Um, and you're right, it, it's about the quality of the strip. And, and if you're going to if you're going to recommend someone use it, you should give them the appropriate instructions of how to get a quality strip. But for this, I'm very happy. I would anticoagulate on this. Absolutely. And it, do you know, it's fantastic that we've also got data from the AF Association. You can actually teach patients to actually check their own pulse. I think everybody over 65, especially if they've got high risk comorbidities, should be taught the importance of checking their own pulse. And if their pulse is irregular, there is no reason why we can't just ship out one of these devices and we can pick up their AF from their living room, save the trace in the notes and get them, uh, get them sorted out in a timely fashion. And a great uh, project, a proof of concept project from the Arrhythmia Alliance. There's a COVID vaccination centre in, in Suffolk. Look at this. 281 alive core checks, 15 newly diagnosed AF patients. I mean, in an era where we've really got to focus on making every contact count, I think this is wonderful sort of food for thought as to the potential of incorporating this technology in our everyday clinical practice. And Shovik, tell us about Capture AF. This was also a very uh, exciting innovation. Absolutely. I, I think you touched upon it earlier, you know, the, the opportunities that we have uh, using these mobile devices. So this is a, a community-based uh, AF screening targeting those over 65. Um, essentially, uh, community pharmacies um, having posters in their windows saying you can get a free uh, heart rhythm check. Uh, as I mentioned, targeting usually those over 65 with comorbidities. And, you know, it's a really good project because we've got um, our hospital pharmacist at the Royal Brompton Harefield, Zena, pictured there with a consultant colleague running this program with multiple community pharmacists. Um, you know, the pharmacists are empowered. They're learning new skills. We're picking up patients. And I think uh, uh, the, the figures are not there, but I think it's in the region of a two to three percent pickup at present. Um, this project is ongoing and we're going to evaluate, you know, uh, how we've done after a certain period of time. But it's been remarkably successful and patients and pharmacists are willing. And that's really important. And I will totally endorse the fact that clinical pharmacists for me are the future engine room of the NHS. They are just so hungry 
to sort yeah. of pick up new skills and uh, and be part of that uh, that pathway. Uh, and of course, cardiovascular involvement in COVID nineteen I think has been grossly underestimated. I mean, the lungs get all of the uh, sort of high profile, don't they? But actually, if you look at this uh, diagram carefully, you can see that when patients get infected with co uh, SARS coronavirus 2, if they do not clear this viral infection within that first week, in, 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 in patients, uh, some patients can, there can be this triggering of a ridiculously potent inflammatory response, otherwise known as cytokine storm. Lots of interleukins, lots of cytokines are just Released, And that's actually what causes most of the damage in hospitalized patients. And of course, we're all familiar with the fact that this can cause a horrible sort of leakiness uh, in the lungs and an inflammatory response and a respiratory distress syndrome. But actually, this in inflammation insult causes a huge amount of damage to the cardiovascular system. We know that inflammation can significantly increase plaque instability and rupture. And I think we are seeing spikes in acute coronary syndrome in patients uh, who've suffered this uh, this syndrome. And also, Shovik, I'm very worried about those patients who have been hospitalized, what that inflammatory insult has done to their future atherosclerotic cardiovascular trajectory. Uh, and I think we're going we're gonna to be seeing this uh, in the months and years to come. But we mustn't also forget that this inflammatory insult can directly damage the heart muscle, causing myocarditis, and cardiomyopathy, which we must be on the lookout for uh, in general practice for patients with residual symptoms. But also, it can really irritate the heart muscle and, and be the cause of arrhythmia. And certainly during the pandemic in my patch, we've seen a big increase in patients presenting with palpitations. And Shovik, I don't think we can put this all down to increased health anxiety during, uh, during sort of lockdown. This is a true phenomenon, isn't it, of, of direct COVID effects? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think um, uh, definitely the, the, the worry is that this is an endothelial, you know, problem, i.e. affecting a lot of the blood vessels, both small, medium, large. But you're right. I mean, fortunately, the myocarditis, i.e. the inflammation of the heart muscle is a rare complication, but it's pretty devastating when it happens. But you're right. I mean, I've seen so many young patients with um, arrhythmias. And actually, they're very symptomatic. They're quite debilitated by them. And actually, when you when you start to monitor these patients with various devices, what you're finding is sort of short but frequent um, runs of atrial rhythm disturbances, for example. So, um, and it's and it's very difficult to manage these patients. I mean, they're usually young. You don't want to put them on drugs, um, but at the same time, you need to do something. Um, I don't think we quite know what the right thing to do yet is. But I'm sure we'll be seeing more and more of this, um, unfortunately. But I mean, that's the beauty of this, some of this remote technology that we've talked about. I mean, to address this, uh, you know, pretty significant cohort of patients that are, that are coming our way with these sort of symptoms is, is going to be difficult without adopting that technology. And this was a very interesting uh, study that was published in the European Heart Journal last year. Shovik, in primary care, we see a lot of sort of infection-related AF. Dare I say, even with, with COVID, as you've just mentioned, you know, patients with lower respiratory tract infection, they're usually elderly, uh, patients who have a UTI, they, they get these transient episodes of AF that resolve spontaneously. But we must resist the temptation, I'm hoping you're going to endorse this, resist the temptation to just say that's AF resolved. Because this study showed more than a third of them infection-related AF episodes end up being hospitalized with AF within a year. And much more worryingly, these patients do have a significantly increased stroke risk. So I guess, Shovik, if you could just help us describe what I call now this sort of progression of AF, this sort of spectrum of disease, and the importance of catching it as early as possible in this prog progression, and risk stratifying, and appropriately anticoagulating at an early stage. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and I, I allude to that sentence I said before, that AF never comes alone. I think prior to AF becoming manifest in symptoms or ECG diagnosis, things have been uh, brewing away for probably 10, 15 years already, i.e. Um, whether it be high blood pressure, diabetes, alcohol consumption, um, poor physical activity, you know, it's all the usual sort of cardiovascular risk factors that are probably 
um, you know, contributing to AF developing. So you really need to try and focus on those elements really early on. But then you come to a point where you're starting to get what's called subclinical AF. So you may not see it per se. The patient may not even have symptoms per se. You may find, uh, you know, you might find an extra atrial ectopic, for example, on a routine ECG or something that gives you a sign that something's brewing. But ultimately, those phases are difficult to capture. Um, then it then progresses generally to an intermittent form of atrial fibrillation, be it symptomatic or not symptomatic. You know, not everyone is symptomatic, actually. And actually, those patients are, in, well, in one way, worse off because they generally uh, get detected much later on in their time course, by which probably a lot of the damage is already done. And it's kind of irreversible in many ways. But yeah, you, you then go into sort of clinical spectrum of AF, it becomes intermittent. The intermittent phase then becomes more, uh, um, more prolonged in terms of episodes and less time between episodes before it becomes persistent. And all the way along that spectrum, the substrate, the kind of atrium, the heart muscle tissue is changing in ways that we can't see, both electrically and also anatomically, i.e. the actual sort of structure of it. I mean, that's really fascinating. I mean, uh, just a couple of points I'm going to make. So this is really illustrating for me this concept of AF begets AF. You know, once the heart has had that taste of AF, I mean, it does love that taste of AF because it seems to want to keep going back into it. And the more times it goes back into AF, the more it wants to go into AF. It's like, a, it's like an addictive uh, sort of drug, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Atrial fibrillation for the heart. And then the other point I wanted to uh, make was in primary care, Shovik, we often sort of, uh, I think, over the importance of symptoms. I mean, we have patients who come to us saying, you know, they've got confirmed paroxysmal AF, but they say, look, I've only had it once or twice a year. But we know these patients, uh, from pacemaker data, actually, we know these patients generally are going in and out of AF far more frequently than they're being symptomatic. Is, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. There is a population of patients that um, probably initial symptoms may not be that debilitating. But if you wait too long um, and that things become much more intense in terms of the paroxysms or become persistent again, you probably have missed the window to do something yeah. that is going to really uh, halt progression. And that's either with lifestyle, drugs or intervention, any of those things uh, you want to really hammer home. So I think... I think what you're trying to say, Yasser, is that we shouldn't think of those very early stages as benign. In fact, that's where we should concentrate our efforts on the most in order to get better uh, results for our patients uh, and quality of years thereafter. Well, I'm on a crusade, Shovik, in my own CCG. I want to retire this read code of AF resolved because I don't think you can ever say you've truly resolved someone's AF. Maybe AF remission but I wouldn't say you can resolve someone's atrial fibrillation. Right. Um, the other big opportunity that I see uh, is streamlining the palpitation pathway in primary care. I mean, up to 25% of referrals from primary care to cardiology are for palpitations or suspected arrhythmia. It's ridiculously common. But when you look at the outcomes of these patients, well over 80% generally have a benign etiology or a non-prognostic uh, underlying uh, condition that doesn't require more anything more than reassurance and rem I think remote ECG monitoring in primary care for the low risk cohort we're talking about the patients with no associated syncope pre-syncope family history no exercise induced palpitations if we, if we put all those other patients to one side and just concentrate on the low risk I think remote ECG monitoring in primary care can safely uh, retire halters. I mean, I, I think we need to start thinking about retiring halters to help reduce time to diagnosis, reduce outpatient, hammer outpatient cardiology referrals, improve the patient journey and experience, massively reduce repeat testing, and uh, ultimately also reduce costs. Because if you look at the classic palpitation pathway in most uh, CCGs, patients pitching up to primary care, they very often get this very convoluted revolving door halter monitoring uh, cycle uh, and due to resource issues particularly in dghs most patients get a ridiculously short period of halter monitoring which has a very low diagnostic yield uh, 
a waiting time for fitting of about six to eight weeks. You've already explained the importance of early diagnosis. And two visits to hospital outpatients for fitting and removal. And I think, Shavik, if you can just now spend the next few minutes explaining some of the technologies out there that can help sort of replace this uh, very convoluted uh, sort of pathway and lead to earlier diagnosis and better outcomes. So I'll let you take over with that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is just a, a slide to just highlight the different sort of technologies we've been using, I would say, for the last sort of 20, 30 years. As you say, the Holter monitor is the, is the best, sort of best known uh, kind of original ambulatory portable device. You can see a little image there with a patient uh, having it hung around their neck, three electrodes, usually recording times um, 24 to 48 hours, but can be up to a week. They're, they're not very expensive. They're, nothing needs to be done by the patient. But really, it's only suitable for patients who have sort of frequent symptoms, i.e. daily or every couple of days. So the, the yield can be low. Um, you don't have the external loop recorders uh, shown there. Again, similar principle, but can actually work up to four weeks. These generally require the patients to activate the recorder because it can't record for that whole duration in, in its entirety. So you're capturing kind of bits where patients think they have symptoms. But as you can appreciate, we've talked already about patients not knowing they may have AF or other arrhythmias. So you're really reliant on the patient being able to identify symptoms to be able to activate it to then get a diagnostic yield. So there are some cons there. I think over the last few years, event recorders and more recently patch ECG monitors have come to their own, i.e. things have got more streamlined in terms of the technology. So the event recorder you can see in that top uh, right corner is more of a single lead ECG device up to, again, uh, a month in terms of recording technology, but again requires activation by the patients. The patch ECG monitors, most, most recent, uh, probably the most expensive in terms of longer term um, monitor. This is single lead, single use, waterproof, so really useful for the patient, really user friendly. Um, ECG quality is very good if, if applied appropriately on, on the patient's chest. Um, these monitors are excellent uh, and can give up to sort of 14 days uh, worth of uh, recording. So you can see that the trajectory has been to get things to become less cumbersome for the patient with better um, data. Just one word about the implantable loop recorders, which you can see at the end of that sort of table there. I mean, we use implantable loop recorders for certain populations. They, they do have a very high diagnostic yield in the right people. So these do need to be um, implanted. So there's a minimally invasive procedure, albeit five to 10 minutes. Um, the device shown there is a, a very old device. Nowadays, they're the, the sort of size of a, a USB drive. Um, but the battery life is three years plus. So these patients uh, that we target for these devices are generally those who have very infrequent symptoms. We're talking sort of monthly or less. Um, or those who have, for example, syncope, so collapses, and we really need to get to a diagnosis fairly quickly. But it does need to be explanted again with a, a procedure. And so, you know, you really want to hone these populations in. And of course, there's an expense for this sort of technology. But I would say things have really kind of moved on in the last five years or so, particularly in the last couple of years. And of course, COVID has accelerated uh, the personal sort of ECG heart rhythm rate detection uh, kit we have. And I would say this is definitely disruptive technology. Um, we have seen the traditional models blurred. I mean, we used to have that model where the physician would prescribe a device, whether it's a halter or an event recorder or whatever, to try and find an arrhythmia. And now things are changing. Now we're getting uh, health conscious patients who are patients or a consumer, depends on which way you look at it, they purchased a device such as a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or whatever it may be, and are now coming to the physician with data to interpret. It's, it's the things, of, the, the tide has changed. Uh, it's amazing. So I wanted to spend a, a moment or two just talking about the types of devices and what they kind of, uh, how they work. So photoplephismography, PPG is the term you may have heard. 
and really is the backbone of a lot of the kind of health watches and things that you will be um, coming across. So your Fitbit, your Fitbits, your Garmin watches, etc. They they use this PPG technology, which is essentially commercially available for many years for pulse oximetry, so to tell your sats, your oxygen saturations, and it uses the technology um, by basically saying that blood um, absorbs light differently to other tissues. So when you get uh, fluctuations in blood volume because of cardiac contraction and relaxation, you get reflectance of light that changes. And this can be plotted in a graphical format to give you heart rate information. And when coupled with, for example, a smartphone app, it can give you information of whether that heart rate is regular or irregular. But things have moved on even further. So now you've got electrode based uh, devices, which again, often are coupled with a smartphone app. I think the two most well-known devices are of course, the AliveCore device and the Apple Watch. And we're now getting single lead ECG traces. And as Yasser has already said, that has now evolved further to six lead ECG traces. And if, if patients and the consumers are told about how to get good, um, you know, told how to record a good tracing, then I would say, you know, these are pretty comparable to a very decent 12 lead ECG. Moving on, just briefly, just to mention about um, uh, interventions, we've talked about air fibrillation briefly. Um, after an ablation, it's important to figure out what's happened to those patients' symptoms, because as I mentioned earlier, these procedures are very much to alleviate symptom burden for patients. So at the moment, there is no real um, gold standard as to how we monitor patients. And in fact, it probably comes down to resource. There's a huge amount of variability. Some centers will just do an ECG uh, every so often, every few months after an ablation. Some will do a halter. Others will do a longer uh, seven-day recording. But there is no real um, gold standard as yet. It's important to note that it's we need to look at the rhythm because recurrent symptoms may not be atrial arrhythmias. They may be simply ectopics or some other non-sustained arrhythmia. And also, patients having asymptomatic AF after ablation is well described. Whether that's a placebo effect, we don't know, but it's well described. So in order to understand the kind of efficacy of our interventions, which I should add are costly, we need to understand how best to, um, to kind of look for recurrences. Now, it's important because the two graphs I'm showing here, these are taken from an implantable loop recorder from a research study. But actually, this is showing, these are two graphs showing one year follow-up of patients after an AF ablation with very different patterns of temporal recurrence. You know, the first patient on the left shows all of the recurrence having in the first couple of months and then completely dying out. Whereas the, the other patient on the, on the right shows lots of different spikes throughout that year. So you really need something, a technology that is going to be able to adapt to kind of these different recurrence patterns. Uh, although we've not had uh, formal, I think, um, research studies validating the use of um, portable ECG devices, this is one study that's just been published, in fact, just about a month ago from a group in the Netherlands that are well respected in the, in the realms of catheter ablation from AF. And they basically said, look, why don't we give patients who are having halters at different time points post ablation in that first year, why don't we give them also an alive core device to keep for four weeks for them to take readings three times a day? And they assessed things like, you know, uh, what was the recurrence of AF as detected by those two technologies, how patients found um, them to, in terms of user friendliness, and also the accuracy of these devices. And lo and behold, they found that actually the live core kind of um, intermittent monitoring was more uh, able to pick up uh, AF recurrences more than the sort of traditional halter, which is not surprising because you're giving them for a longer period of time. But also the patients found it easier to use, which I think is really, really important. And furthermore, if you look at the kind of figures in terms of sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value and negative predictive value, they are incredibly respectable. So I think there is a huge piece of work that needs to be done about 
whether these devices can actually be used more formally in research, but also in clinical forums to assess how well we do after an AF ablation, which is very much to mitigate symptoms. Finally, a brief word. I think we, we do need to touch upon this briefly. So cryptogenic stroke. So this is when patients, unfortunately, their first kind of presentation to uh, medical care is with a stroke. And they're not known to have AF. And in these patients, we really do need to find whether there is intermittent or persistent, uh, or persistent uh, AF that has caused this stroke. So the current recommendation is that you use short-term ECG monitoring for at least 24 hours. And if nothing's found, to then go on to slightly more longer periods, such as 72 hours. But clearly, if you have someone at risk with the usual sort of risk factor profile as determined by Chad's VAS score or another scoring system such as the CHESS score, i.e. over 65 with hypertension, maybe thyroid disease, then you need to look harder. And although there's been no kind of randomized control studies to show that post-stroke monitoring in this population is cost effective, it is highly likely to be because if they've gotten away, gotten away with a, let's say, mild stroke, you really want to prevent something more calamitous uh, with reducing their quality of life uh, thereafter. Yes, yeah, so back to you for the QT. Yeah, very now. quickly now, I promise you, Helen. So look, the QT <laughs> interval is now becoming really important uh, for us in primary care. Dare I say it induces a bit of arrhythmia for many of us <laughs> trying to assess these patients. So this is the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. Slightly different cutoffs you can see as a normal range for women. For whatever reason, God has deemed that women's hearts just take a little bit longer to recover uh, electrically, not emotionally, uh, than men's. Uh, but we must look at the QTC in primary care because that corrects for heart rate. The QT does vary with heart rate. And uh, most ECG machines will give you a fairly accurate QTC, which uh, corrects for that uh, heart rate variability. And it's a pretty obvious spot diagnosis when it's really, really obvious. So I would be very worried about this patient, because if you look at the QT interval of that T wave is more than halfway between the RR interval. And you shouldn't ever see that, because if this patient's heart rate starts to increase, uh, we'll show you what happens a bit later on. But obviously, 12-lead ECG can be cumbersome uh, to monitor someone's QT. And we've now got a validated use of the six-lead alive call for actually identifying patients with a long QT. So here you can see, if you look at the top left-hand corner, that's a QT interval of 671 milliseconds. Uh, I'm sure Shovik is already rubbing his hands uh, thinking, oh, I need to see this patient or find out what this patient's on. Because if you do get a situation where you get an R wave, bang on a T wave, uh, Shovik, this is what happens is you get this horrible life-threatening polymorphic VT. And this is truly life-threatening, isn't it? You wouldn't want to see this uh, in general practice. No, absolutely. I mean, this is what's called polymorphic uh, VT or Tossard. Um, and this can rapidly degenerate further into full-on ventricular fibrillation. I mean, this sort of ECG, a patient is not conscious uh, or likely to be just about to, you know, pass out. So, and this can happen quite easily with the sort of QT ECGs you've just shown, Yasser. So, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's important, and, and I know you're going to go on to this. There are many sort of things that can cause this, which are very much iatrogenic. So, I'm going to let you yeah. <laughs> talk well, about Well, that. Shavik, and this can occur in a young, healthy patient purely because they've got this long QT interval. And that's a real tragedy uh, because a lot of these patients, I have to say, are not being monitored appropriately. So look, there's multiple causes. Of course, we're going to check the electrolytes in primary care if we see someone with a prolonged QT, particularly hypocalcemia, trying to identify that. By the same token, if you've got someone with significant hypocalcemia, I think we are duty bound to check their QT. But of course, the most common cause of a prolonged QT interval, certainly in our practice in, in general, in primary care, would be drugs, especially those antipsychotics especially those atypical antipsychotics uh, that we love to prescribe because they're incredibly effective at putting psychosis uh, into remission and patients are very reliant on them. But we've got to respect them because they very much delay opening of potassium channels and can, and can significantly elevate uh, QTC. And there's lots of algorithms that I've found in the NHS, uh, clear algorithms about baseline QT documentation before you start an antipsychotic and then one to two weeks after starting or increasing the dose, we should check it. 
And, a, and an absolute red flag has to be 500 milliseconds. But unfortunately, Shovik, probably because of the cumbersome nature of doing lots of 12 lead ECGs, this is not very well uh, adhered to. And what do you think of uh, using uh, you know, things like the six leader live call to try and address this? No, absolutely. I mean, you're completely right. This is this is not done uh, at all often for patients on on drugs that you've mentioned, um, and and that's because it's well, it's just a it's just a hassle, isn't it? Let's face it. So if we can make that easier, then uh, then absolutely. And I think the live quote, as you say, was validated during the COVID period. Yeah, definitely. Well, actually, the European Society of Cardiology have this fantastic guidance for. Uh, managing cardiovascular disease during COVID, and just have a look at this. They've actually, you know, the most prestigious guidance in cardiology have now endorsed six lead cardiomobile for this absolute use with a with a fantastic negative sort of uh, high specificity, I should say, for picking up these long QTCs. And we've also got a proof of concept project. I found this really exciting. This really innovative consultant uh, psychiatrist, care of the elderly psychiatrist, um, Dr. Manny. Uh, Krishnan uh, oversaw this project in the north of England um, using uh, mobile ECG technology, the six leader live call for monitoring patients on antipsychotic medication. Spectacular outcomes. I'm just going to uh, signpost to, to one or two of them. 17 and a half minutes saved per ECG. That translates to 255 days saved across a year in that one trust. And if you extrapolate that in terms of cost savings, that's 327,000. Uh, pounds worth of cost savings to that one trust just by adopting this for ECG monitoring in patients on antipsychotic medication. And look at the spectacular patient feedback. Shovik, this has to be the new standard of care for QTC monitoring, doesn't it? And if you've got this sort of spectacular outcome with high specificity endorsed by the ESC. Yeah, I think I think it's really exciting, this development. I think this is really going to revolutionise uh, this area of practice, which has been very difficult to manage, I think, for both primary and secondary care. Right. So I promise you we're, com we're coming to an end now. Just just to say, I'm not going to go through these data, but basically we've got some very reassuring emerging evidence that supports use of ECG monitoring with the Alive called Cardiomobile device across a variety of healthcare settings. We've got the Rehearse AF study, which is a, a sort of screening study, massive increase uh, yield in terms of AF detection in particular, asymptomatic uh, patient uh, detection of AF. And then the iHeart study was post uh, cardioversion and radiofrequency ablation. Again, significant improvement in diagnostic yield. And finally, we've got this one that was deployed across uh, A&E departments in, in, in patients presenting with palpitations or pre-syncope, a nine-fold increase in arrhythmia detection. And crucially, this massively reduced time to detection of 30 days, which Shovik has already reinforced, can have great uh, outcome benefits. So uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Just a, a take home points that we've very much um, embraced the COVID-19 pandemic, tried to um, you know, a, a find solutions to, to these challenges. And far from being a compromise, as I said at the outset, these re new remote pathways that we've developed and identified are actually driving earlier and higher yielding detection, I think in a much more efficient manner, leading to better patient outcomes and actually um, better patient experience. And I think this will hopefully leave a legacy in the post COVID era. We get these much more streamlined, leaner and more acceptable uh, pathways which are convenient for patients. And finally, we've got to talk about cost. Hopefully for now, we can move away from just looking at acquisition cost of an intervention and look at total healthcare costs and look at reduction in downstream health utilization. Because if we continue to be silo budgeted and only look at the upfront costs and not look at the total value of a pathway, I think we're gonna stuff ourselves for a sustainable future. Thank you very much for uh, your time. Shovik, you're an absolute superstar. It was a pleasure to present with you. And I think we've still got some time for questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Uh, we have got some time for questions. We're going to go on a little bit beyond the uh, 11 o'clock, if you two are all right with that. Yes. Um, because people are fascinated by what you have talked about. We're getting great feedback in the chat box and we do also have some some questions. So um, one thing that came up that you 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 highlighted was this issue of single episodes of AF. 
So a patient maybe has infection, gets AF, they're at higher risk of having AF again in future, higher risk of stroke. So what should we be doing about those patients? Is it a question of more monitoring or should we be initiating anticoagulation straight away if their CHADS VAS score justifies it? Well, let, me get, let me give my primary care perspective and let's hear what the expert, the real expert says. <laughs> but I would do a CHADS VAS score on this patient. If it's two or more, even if it was just one episode of AF, I would be probably getting some advice and guidance from my secondary care colleague as to whether we should be anticoagulating this patient, whether they need further monitoring, whether we need to do an echo to look at left atrial size. You know, all these sorts of things I think we now have to come into play and obviously reinforce those crucial lifestyle interventions, in particular weight loss. Weight loss in these patients is really important. David, yeah. what's your thoughts? I would agree. I think it gives, you know, they clearly that patient clearly has something in their heart that has a propensity to go into AF. It's just been triggered by the infection. So I think this is an opportunity to, as I mentioned earlier, to act early and intervene early. So perhaps the lifestyle intervention bit is really important here. I mean, obviously, if they have a high CHAS VAS score, you'll be thinking along the lines of monitoring them closely and considering anticoagulation. But if it's much earlier, let's say in your 30s or 40s, I think that's the time to really focus on educating them and also making them aware that if you get more symptoms, we should be thinking about AF. Great. Um, and in terms of access to these devices, um, what, are you, what are you aware of in terms of patients being able to get hold of them? Is it that they have to buy them themselves? Are they loaned? Uh, what's your experience? So, I mean, I've been such an early adopter of these devices and uh, I've got loads <laughs> in the practice. So for my patients, uh, they can actually pick one up from the surgery, but they're actually quite cheap. Uh, I mean, 100, 150 pounds for the six lead. I think, uh, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but for a, li for a device that's going to last a lifetime if you look after it, I mean, those brushed titanium electrodes don't only look aesthetically pleasing, they're actually very robust. Uh, you just need to change the battery from time to time. 99p from Amazon, you can get one of these batteries. So I don't think it's a bad investment to make. But personally, in, in our clinical practice, we loan them out to, to patients. And what about um, how patients yeah, receive them? Do they get concerned? Does it increase their stress? Because obviously they don't really understand what the device is showing. Show it. Um there is a subset of patients where you can increase, you know, worry and concern. Um, but most people, I think, who are willing to, so for example, I don't have a stock of device to give out to patients. I generally tend to tell patients to get them if they're interested um, in being able to kind of, you know, streamline their kind of diagnosis. Um, and as you'd expect, there is a little bit of an age divide here. So there's a digital divide when we're talking about this. So there's sort of more younger and perhaps one could even say perhaps more um, affluent patients will tend to uh, go and, and buy one of these devices. But they tend to report really good, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of feedback in using them generally. Um, you've got to temper that that uh, usage um, with sending in lots and lots of strips <laughs> to, the, to the GP practice or secondary care. Um, so there needs to be some data management discussion, as it were. Um, but if yeah. that's done appropriately, then I think it can be managed very well and patients are very happy to use them on the whole. Can I just say the reassurance that a patient gets, particularly that patient who's had five or six halters and when they've never captured their episode and then suddenly we get correlation, ECG correlation of their episode, and it's just a couple of ectopics. I don't yeah. think you can quantify that. And I think time to diagnosis or time to reassurance is such a crucially important metric for the mental health and well-being of many of our patients. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And a question, I know you're going to be very passionate about this one. If a patient has intermittent AF, is getting weekly episodes that they confirm by their pulse and their cardio mobile, what should they do? Should they be seeing their GP? <laughs> so, Shavit, can you dispel this myth that uh, high burden paroxysmal AF is not is is just as risky, if not more risky, than persistent AF? Because I think that's the, that's the key to understanding that from a primary care perspective. Absolutely. I mean, these patients we should not be sitting on. We should be seeing, uh, and you know, actively intervening via all those things we've mentioned, be it lifestyle, drugs, intervention, or a combination of whatever suitable. 
but I think these patients do need to be escalated in terms of their care so that proper discussions can be had about their management. Absolutely. And if you were going to do some targeted case finding, where would you target? Where would your high impact um, um, sites for targeted case finding be? For me, um, well, age is, is always going to be your biggest risk factor. So I'll start off with age, 65. But then if you really want to prioritise, from, from my experience, Shavik, it's the diabetic hypertensive. They've got this microvascular and macrovascular trajectory. If you've got microvascular disease, you're, or, you know, of your neuropathy, of your retina, you are definitely going to have microvascular disease in your heart. And combined with sort of the natural <coughs> aging process, uh, I find I'm picking up a lot of patients uh, in that cohort. Uh, so diabetic foot clinic for me, we did a project in my CCG. My diabetologist, he was a bit sceptical, but I said, you go to all the effort of checking foot pulses, but you never screen for AF in your 70-year-old patient with diabetic foot disease. It's just nonsensical. I, I've now convinced him he, he thinks it's now an essential part of a diabetic review to do an alive core trace on, on these patients, such as the diagnostic yield. That's one of the high impact cohorts within the podiatry uh, projects, isn't it? A lot of diabetic patients going in for their uh, for their foot management, foot care, and uh, and if they haven't been picked up elsewhere, being picked up I'll, through the podiatry work. I'll say work. Agree, uh, obstructive sleep apnea as well, massively high risk cohort. They got they got really high atrial dimensions whenever I echo them. Uh, these patients, I think, Shovik, would you agree, should have almost mandated uh, annual screening? For, yeah, for I think uh, I think you've identified those groups nicely. So diabetes, hypertension, obesity itself, um, and the obstructive sleep apnea population definitely need much more rigorous assessment. Agree. <sighs> So you 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 discuss this in the in the talk itself, but um, how do you feel about the difference between twelve lead ECG for diagnosis versus um, single lead ECG? Uh, you did highlight it, but someone's asking a question about would a twelve lead ECG as the gold standard result in better diagnosis and better outcomes? Well, well look, I don't want to do twelve lead ECG to service. What I'm, what we're saying is for diagnosis of AF. If you've got a good quality trace, whether it's 12 lead, one lead, six lead, it is sufficient. But of course, once you've diagnosed AF, it's sensible to get a 12 lead because you want to look at more than just the rhythm. You know, I want to look at a lot more than just the rhythm in an AF patient. But in terms of, uh, for me, anticoagulation and uh, diagnosing AF, I think a one lead sufficient, but I will always get a 12 lead later on. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, uh, just just to give you some insight from our community AF project. So the, the, the uncertain uh, single lead ECG traces come to um, the consultants for review. Now, um, there are uh, the vast majority. I think you can tell whether there's sinus rhythm, normal rhythm or atrial fibrillation or whether there's atrial ectopics or whatever. But there is still a subset where it truly is difficult to ascertain what's going on. And we will always go back to the 12 lead ECG. So I'm not saying it's not needed. It totally has its place, but I think the single lead ECG can do a fantastic job in the vast proportion of patients. And for me, the single lead ECG is a great sort of rule out. So pulse checks yeah. themselves are very non-specific, and yeah. you will end up sending a lot more people for 12 leads, which end up being negative. Uh, if you put that to me, the, the way uh, one of the ways that, that uh, these devices sort of make their money in terms of savings is by preventing you sending a load of people that don't need a 12 lead for a 12 lead, um, which is a waste of everyone's time and reassure the patient that actually they're just having the occasional ectopic that's not going to increase their risk of, of any adverse outcome. Um, and, and I guess the beauty of, of the uh, of the alive core, for example, is that it has a high sort of sensitivity. It's not if, if it says it's normal, it is normal. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I would agree with that, Helen. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. It's it's really good at um, reassuring those who don't have clear atrial arrhythmias. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that can really improve, well, just the flow of patients. Uh, why would we want to send a load of patients that don't need a 12 lead through? Because it's preventing those that really need the 12 lead from getting access, uh, increasing waiting times, etc. And from a commissioning perspective, and I've just scribbled down commissioning, uh, you know, we need to be able to make these arguments that that's where the advantage, uh, the financial advantage, I guess, to to investing in these technologies is to justify, um, but also, you know, 
so many clinical advantages, increasing the time to diagnose, well, reducing the time to diagnosis, speeding up the time for which patients can get treatment. Yes, yeah, so can um, I ask you a quick question, uh, just sure. very briefly? I was just thinking about you uh, um, giving um, patients, or loaning them rather, is the term you used. Um, I mean, what's the what's the feeling of how long do you loan them for? Do you get them all back? What how's it work? Because we haven't done that yet in secondary care. So we I only loan them to patients who've um, self screened an irregular pulse. So we're looking to pick up the um, persistent AF. I haven't actually loaned it for patients who are getting infrequent palpitations because we could end up lending out a device not getting it back until sort of two yeah. or three years. So just for point of care screening in the patient's home. For that, you know, that diabetic elderly patient who's had a virtual review and they picked up an irregular pulse. Yeah, uh, I'd want a point of care screen for that. So, yeah, we just one off screen and then send it back. Um, obviously, that these are patients we, we wanted to prevent uh, coming into the surgery. Uh, it's sort of not 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 anymore, but that, yeah. but that sort yeah. of cohort. No, that, that seems like a pragmatic approach. Yeah, absolutely. And um, is there a big difference between the six lead? And the single lead um, tracings, what difference does it make to you? I, th I think it's not just the fact you're getting six leads. I think this Bluetooth technology, the moving away from... I think I just get... Maybe it's just me, but I'm just finding the quality of the trace seems to, be, uh, seems to have been enhanced quite considerably. And I very rarely get much noise. So... Um, I mean, the one lead, the rhythm strip, uh, you know, is a good lead to, to pick up someone's rhythm. But uh, for, for me, it's more the quality as, uh, as well as getting the, getting the, the other leads. Uh, I don't know, Shavik, if you've got any experience on the six lead? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I do. And I, I do think you get um, better quality uh, ECGs. But also sometimes when there is um, a little bit of sort of artifact in that baseline of the ECG, sometimes you can discern the P wave better when you have multiple leads. Um, so it can help. But, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it, I think either a one lead or a six lead, if we start to make inroads in using these much more frequently in some of the situations we've discussed, then I think we'll make a lot of progress uh, in AF diagnosis, in QT monitoring, etc. cetera. So um, I think both are equally useful. The six lead sometimes gives a little bit more how can I put it? High fidelity of the of the P wave. Great. And uh, another question, I think, for you, Shiva. Um, What's the minimum period of AF we need to consider anticoagulating? A nice controversial one. Is there an evidence base for this, or is it consensus opinion? Yeah, this is a difficult one, and I think this um, there are a number of uh, big, big international trials addressing this um, in terms of uh, pacemaker data. I think at the very least, nowadays, we need a, a full sort of 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation um, to be comfortable. If we're talking about um, patients who have implantable devices in where there is this signal of high rates, but not clear AF, then it's tricky. I think there needs to be more work at, at the very moment. We would be anticoagulating in that um, scenario if you have at least sort of six to 12 hours. But there is some work ongoing that even shorter periods may mandate uh, anticoagulation. But, it, you know, if you can record it on an ECG, um, then I'm very happy to be thinking about anticoagulation, particularly if the scoring system suggests that they are at risk. I mean, technically, Helen, a 12 lead ECG is just a 10 second trace. I mean, it'd be Sheer coincidence if you only picked up exactly three, 10 seconds <laughs> that the patient was in. But technically, you're, you were anticoagulating on 10 seconds of recording. Yeah. Well, my view is if you can find it in primary care using those sorts of spot checks, <laughs> then it's probably there a lot longer than the, yeah, the, the period Correct. of recording. It's Correct. the pacemaker analysis, I guess, that gets very confusing when you're seeing very small, limited yeah. periods. But frequency is, is high, so for example, across a year. But I think in primary care, the message is if you can find the AF, <laughs> and capture it on a single six lead or 12 lead ECG, then there's, there's likely to be enough AF there to, to justify Absolutely. treatment. Absolutely. And that's yeah. what the ESC now say. So you're backed up by some pretty prestigious guidance now. So in terms of QT interval monitoring, um, 
how accurate is the six lead versus a 12 lead? A lot of people talk about needing precordial leads for, for accurate QT monitoring. Any, any comments on that? So I, for anyone worried about that, I would uh, look up that ESE guidance. Uh, it's got some really good references, and in particular, uh, the reference for the specificity of picking up QTCs above 450 was very, very high. I, I can't recall the exact number, but it's all reference. As far as I'm concerned, if it's good enough for the ESE, <laughs> it's going to be good enough for my clinical practice and hopefully good enough for a medico legal lawyer. I mean, we, we looked at it in South East London just with the single lead and we found that um, although it wasn't exa didn't exactly align with the ECG, it was actually slightly more conservative. So we, mm. were, we would identify yeah. patients that we might have other concerns about and could go on to do a 12 lead. But again, it reduced the absolute burden of 12 lead ECGs okay. in, in this particular cohort and, and moved things along a lot quicker. Well, can uh, I just specify for, for the QTC, I think you really have to use the six lead uh, device. It, and that's the one that was specifically mentioned uh, in the, uh, the ECG ECG guide. You can't, yeah. I don't think you could be using the one lead for QTC measurements. Yeah, we just did a project to see whether what the alignment yeah. would look like. But with the six lead, it, it's more accurate, isn't it? Uh, for for QTC calculation. For QTC, yeah. um, I'm just looking to see whether there's any more um, any more questions that are burning. I think we've answered most of the questions. I think people have been really fascinated by by your presentation, particularly. Hopefully, interested in the in the discussions that we have had since then. Um, as a commissioner sitting on the CCG side. I think it's a challenge really to think about, well, how can we make these sorts of technologies much more accessible for patients where they're going to improve the, the pathway, improve the patient experience and ultimately uh, improve access to potentially life saving therapies like anticoagulation in AF uh, to minimise the risk of stroke and, and the consequences, not just uh, the, the fact that AF related stroke is associated with high mortality, uh, it's actually very significant long term morbidity for those that survive. And that's that's a very important um, issue that we need to address. So we've run over a little bit. Hopefully people will forgive us for that so that we can um, so that we could have answered some of the questions that you were putting to uh, Yasser and Shovik. It just for me to say thank you so much for that presentation. It was absolutely excellent. If we've missed any questions, we will go through the chat and uh, make sure we produce some um, some answers that we can distribute to the attendees uh, at a later date. And uh, the webinar has been recorded so people can access it um, online as well if they want to revisit some of the issues we've discussed. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you for contributing with your questions. And thank you again to Yasser and Shovit. Thank Goodbye. you very much.